for the first three weeks are exercises on completely letting go and learning what it's like to have no expectations when you're making a work of art because it's the gap between expectations, having no expectations up on that towards no expectations, that's where the magic happens. Because I think when we're self-conscious, we don't make good art. Hi, everyone. This week, we're talking to Carmel Byrne. Carmel is an artist and owner of Scratch Art Space Gallery based in Marrickville, Sydney. She studied at the National Art School. She also studied a Bachelor of Visual Arts Honours in Canberra. She did a Master's of Fine Art at University of New South Wales. She's held exhibitions in Australia and internationally. In this week's episode, we talk about letting go, how drawing skills can impact day-to-day life, and navigating energy. If you know someone personally, professionally, or even on social media, they might have a cool story, a creative hustle, or they just live life differently. Those are my people. Please email message DM me your recommendations so I can invite them on the show. My social is at IamBarneyPreet and my email is b at IamBarneyPreet.com. All right, let's get to the episode. For those of our viewers and listeners who don't know, I interned, well, I was an artist in residence at Scratch Art Space, mm-hmm. but then I also like helped with a little admin here and there. So I had, I don't remember even how long it was, but I was a baby. I was a baby. You were. You were so young. I was so young. I have a photo of it. I'm going to, I'll post. Cute. Uh, <laughs> I bet you get a lot of artists like that just out of. I know, do. I love it. So many young artists. I have like two interns at the moment. I know one's 20. The other one might be a bit younger. And yeah, it's really great. Mm. Yeah. It's so nice to have that kind of young vibe, which is the one of the goals of Scratch Art Space Gallery, right? To support young artists. Yes. Yeah, but when you were young, you did say once that you were kicked out of your art classes. <laughs> <laughs> when I was at school, not at art school. Okay, I need to all clarify right. that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was only fifteen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I um, but you did say that you know you were very um, active. You know, I was and very spirited. Tell me about that. Um, I think I've always had a lot of energy and school isn't that great for people who have high energy um, because you have to be still quite still. (laughs) And I think I went to a new high school. I went to quite a small primary school and the new high school I went to, I didn't know anyone. There were over a thousand, it was a Catholic school, all girls, over a thousand students. And I had to start from scratch making friends. So one way of doing that was to be a bit naughty and push the boundaries a little bit. And I did end up bonding with a great group of friends who I'm still see annually. Oh, so it worked. Yes, it did. We all, we all ended up being comedians and competing with who could make everyone laugh the most. <laughs> You've done a lot of traveling. And one thing I read is that you were, you, you used to teach uh skiing is that right so i didn't teach skiing okay. i was what you call a ski bum what what does that mean what's a ski, a bum? ski bum is someone who works out how to ski all winter without working too much <laughs> <laughs> and you did that in queenstown in new, in new zealand and I you did, did that in france Yes, in in Queenstown, I worked in the boot. I did work up on the hill, up on Coronet Peak, um, in the ski hire, and then um, in Queens, in um, Val d'Isere, in France, I cleaned on Saturday and Sunday, and skied Monday to Friday. <gasps> that sounds yeah, it was like pretty amazing. amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I just I'm really interested in snowboarding now. Mm. And I've just been, I did my first, I skied for the first time probably five, six years ago and I fell in love with it, but I stacked Mm. it so hard, like really badly. It was hilarious, but like the thrill of it and the energy of it, I didn't, I didn't get over. And so I'm, I'm thinking, and now I'm living in Canberra. So I'm thinking that I should, you know, check in for a whole season and learn. (laughs) Definitely. You're so close. So it's, if you're a free spirit, you really connect with skiing, I think, because that's what I loved about it. And But, of course, when I went to art school, then I just never skied again <laughs> because yeah. I had bigger fish to fry, I think, 
yeah, what yeah, I do now did. definitely feels that that sort of creative energy is channeled. Yeah, yeah. the energy is still there, but the, just the avenue is different. That's right. Yeah. You did night classes at a national art school. National art school used to be a jail, so it's not exactly <laughs> <laughs> fun to go for an evening class. <laughs> but how yeah. is that? How is that? How were those evening classes for you? Well, to be honest, it was, I was about 28. I had spent most of my 20s traveling abroad. I lived in Europe for three years. I had just returned and I decided I needed to educate myself. I left school at 16. And um, so I did HSC for a year and then I was working full time. And where I studied, I would go to, to the National Art School after work three nights a week from six till nine. I was living in Chippendale, which was pretty rough back in those days as well. So, yeah. It, it, was? it was? Yes. It was really rough. <laughs> Define rough. What do you mean? Oh, people would get bashed up. There was a lot of heroin. It was, yeah, there was a lot of people passing through that area. It was dark. It wasn't very well lit, the streets. Very right. different to what it is now. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Okay. And so you were doing those night classes and is that how your interest for drawing began or were you a drawer before that? No, I wasn't because I think it was always there, but I didn't know about it. And when I started going to night school, I realized I I had two ideas. I was either going to start a business, but if I got into art school, I was going to um, study full time, which is what ended up happening. But to be honest, I think I would have gone that way anyway, to be honest. And then, um, Yes, and then I, so I worked, did three nights a week for one year. Then I had a portfolio together. I applied for full time and then I got into NAS in 1990. And how different is NAS 1990 to NAS today? Well, it's actually quite different because it was a tech then and it was quite a lot of fun because it was quite diverse, which I think was a good thing in a way. And so you'd have the butchers walking around with all their, they were like big blokey blokes with all their knives and everything. And (laughs) and the art students, usually like the women would be like yelling at them, at them, calling them meatheads. And then they'd yell back at them. (laughs) But it was like, it wasn't vicious. It was kind of fun. It was really fun. They were catering there. It was a whole very different school. And I loved it there. I really loved, it was really great school. Yeah, I think that something that I, in hindsight, would have loved to do was to go to National Art School before I went to College of Sydney College of the Arts because, you know, National Art School, I mean, some everyone has their own perspective on art and what you, you know, what tools you need, but I think in order to um, break the rules, you need to learn them, you know. I believe and, that. Yeah, and so I felt like, uh, when I was at Sydney College of the Arts and I didn't know any better and like that's all I knew at that time and it just showed up and I had the best time but in hindsight I thought I could have been able to express myself more I could have articulated myself better in my paintings had I learned the technique before how did you even start Scratch Art Space like where did it even come from for you to even decide you wanted to create a gallery of your own in a business Well, at first it was really studio, having studio space. And I had shared studios for a number of years. Um, That was after, like I married in 95 and I married a professional and we lived over, then again, that was a number of years of me living abroad and traveling as well, but different because we're all working. And um, so we actually, when I was married, we bought the warehouse in Marrickville. I knew that was in 2002. And I knew then at that stage, artists were being run out of Darlinghurst in those areas. And I knew this little industrial area. I knew it was next to Sydenham Station, which was even then had, was um, quite a well-used station, has two lines running through it. And I just knew that that's, if you're an artist in Sydney, this is where you'd move to. So, um, I needed a base as well. We are still sort of moving around. After we bought the building, I had a, a friend move in and run it. So I set up the business just as studios. And then we went and we were living in Bermuda for three years. So um, online banking was just coming in at that time. So I could do all the finances from Bermuda. And I just had someone here to 
you know, help someone move in and move out if they were doing that. Yeah. So it was a need that I had. I uh, knew in the future I'd need a studio, but at that time I needed a base in Sydney as well. We didn't have a home in Sydney, so this warehouse was where I was, where I would come home to when I came back. <laughs> How would you describe your paintings to a seven-year-old if, if they just walked into your gallery? Um, I don't know. What would I say? I think I'd just, I'd just love them to sort of go into the works and sort of connect to it. I think that's what I'd say to them. You don't need to say anything. You don't need to think anything. Just feel the paintings because that's what my paintings are about. Even though I totally believe in structuring painting and I build up structure, and but in the end they are about sort of sensations of feelings really. Where did the name Scratch Art Space come from? Um, starting from scratch because yeah, when I set up years ago it was two studios and then I went through a divorce and then I really had to get my shit together and I just it was like um, it really was a bit of a survival thing because there was I knew I was going to make money from art for if I was going to make money from art it was going to take a while so I um, changed it to scratch because I was starting from scratch <laughs> I remember, oh my goodness, it just came to me. One of the exhibitions, I think it was the last time that I was there, there was an exhibition going on. There was a swing in the gallery. Do you remember that? There was this I made that swing. <laughs> you made that, of course. There was this ginormous swing and I just <laughs> now remember just being in the gallery and swinging. It was incredible. And so the energy of that was always it, it was always changing, you know. I remember um, there was a couple that were renting the space and they turned it into a poultry night. And, you know, you have your workshops that you're running upstairs. And I wonder, can you tell us a little bit about your workshops and what you're running so viewers and listeners can get an insight on that? Well, it's taken me a number of years to refine it, but now I have nutted it out. I had uh, all the students that I had this year did really well all the way through. So I start the year, I like to... Um, run courses for beginners that's my um, I think that's where my heart is I think because I really feel because I think we're all creative but we don't all find a way to express it not everyone expresses their creativity through art but I think a lot of us lose the desire or lose the confidence with visual art especially when I went through school through school art classes <laughs> because it's a very complicated thing, art. And what I like to do is break it down into very simple components. And the, I think where I'm different from other schools is that I've done a lot of therapy as well and I've done meditation and I have a fairly good knowledge of what it is to let go and how important that is as a human being. Um, so the beginning of the classes, I use exercises, which are quite well known, like blind contours and things like that. But there's little aspects to it that you don't read in books about those exercises. You have to be with someone to truly learn them. And so the first three weeks are exercises on completely letting go and learning what it's like to have no expectations when you're making a work of art, because it's the gap between expectations, having no expectations up on that towards no expectations, that's where the magic happens. Because I think when we're self-conscious, we don't make good art. There's something about that self-consciousness, which I think is who we think we are rather than who we actually are, gets in the way of making work related to who we actually are, if that makes sense. It does. And <laughs> I would think that, you know, that's it's your choice it's a choice that you make so art is when you're actually drawing you're making choices and part of which a uh, part of your exercises you do is you make sure that that commentary that inner critic is silenced or I don't know befriended and asked politely to be quiet so tell us about that tell us about that process when you work with the drawer you know to work on that inner critic well, I constantly talk about it, say, don't listen to that voice. Um, I say things like that voice is either a parent or a school teacher. It was someone in the past that told you, that tried to define you with a statement 
And usually if it's, if it's a negative one, we really take it on and we hold it. So I'm constantly reminding everyone. And the exercises are things like you can't, you look at an object and you pretend to touch. This is the secret between blind contours is that you have to pretend you're touching the object. And that really shifts that voice. It gets confused, I think, and it gets a bit annoyed. And if you really stick to your gun, so I'm constantly reminding them to just do that exercise, pretend you're touching the object, blind contour, don't look at the page. It's incredibly challenging. You wouldn't believe how people have a lot of difficulty with it. But the ones that let go, they move into a completely different level on their work. Just for people who have no idea about that, could you explain I, that for a minute? A blind contour is when you cannot, it's, completely blind because you can't look at the page so you usually put it a little bit aside so you can't see it and you have either a person like a model or an object in front of you you have a sharp pencil it's one line you can't lift the pen off the page and you choose a point to start on the contour and then you touch it with your pencil you have to imagine that the pencil's touching the edge of the shoulder and then you just very slowly draw every little contour then you sort of turn into mapping then you're actually mapping the contour of that figure but the important aspect is letting go that's the main crutch of that exercise have those exercises from drawing helped you in your life yes they have How have because they i think anything you? that sorry i think anything that helps you let go helps we're such little control freaks you know, our body, when you think of control, how body tenses. And I think we all live like that for too many hours of a day. And I think if you, like meditation is the same thing. So I used, to, I used to practice transcendental meditation, not with TM Incorporated, though, with another group. And it's really a practice of letting go, um, following a mantra, and then you let it go. And... So it does cross. I think I'm lucky I've had those experiences and I've worked out how they're all connected now and it's all to do with creativity. And there are so many people who think that they're not creative or they don't have that art thing in them or that art gene in them. And I think that people forget how long it takes to draw and to build that skill set of drawing, you know, but even separate from that, separate from the practice of any art, craft or medium. It's just that you're so right. It's that ability to let go and that applies. I can, I can just, while you were saying that, I just thought of so many things, you know, to let go of. That would be so helpful <laughs> for, you know, everyone in their own craft and in their own activities. Will you tell us a bit about your In the Grove paintings? Well, the In the Grove paint, like one of the problems with setting up this business is I didn't have much time to, with my own practice. And I was very patient, I must admit. And for a long time, I would have my studio, but I was only working in very small works. And then I ended up hating those paintings because they were so small and tight. And it's hard to let go when you're small and tight. I think that's the other thing with letting go is you, you expand. So when the first COVID lockdown happened, I already had two canvases that I hadn't used for my MFA and they were 244 and 183 centimetres. So they were two and a half metres high. So I pulled them out and I was like, I'd been looking at, been waiting for so long to be able to paint on them. And then from these tiny little drawings I do in the life drawing, I run a life drawing group every Saturday morning and I had very small, they're only about that big. And from these small drawings, I thought, look, I, I know I can translate that into a really big painting. I just thought, I know it will work on a large scale. I wasn't 100%. So I just started on those small drawings, sort of projecting them up into very big canvases. Um, and that was the beginning of In the Grove. So really In the Grove, I ended up titling all the works after Greek mythology, goddesses, the nymphs, the everything. I would sort of capture something from the model initially and then for me it was a lot of projection onto the paintings and they're really about expression and through those expressions I was connecting to Greek characters that I felt fitted with that expression so yeah that was the beginning of In the Grove and I think I will continue doing that 
for ever probably. How have you let go in your practice? It's a constant. One thing I do, like one thing aspect that I do need to be conscious about is to be conscious about letting go and knowing how to get into a space to let go naturally. I don't think you can say, okay, now I'm going to let go. It doesn't work like that. It needs to be like subconscious really. But you, to begin, you need to remind yourself consciously about it and then eventually it sort of goes into the subconscious and you can just sort of sleep. That's, that's what being in the zone is really. So, yes, with like, I mean, working on a large scale like that was really expanding my skills. I'd never worked on that scale and I had to completely rethink how I applied the paint, the size of the brushes I was using, the way I was layering. So um, it was... I think if I didn't let go, I wouldn't have had the courage to do that. And letting go was like, you know, it's, you just have a go, don't you? <laughs> it's like, it doesn't matter if it doesn't work. That's letting go. Yeah, you try, if you don't succeed, it's really fine. It's just life. Yeah. I, I was just talking to my mum the other day about, you know, starting the project and it's always starting it is the most nerve wracking part. And then once you're in it, you're fine because you're building momentum. But it's always the first maybe 20 seconds of something just to like start and get into it, you know. And I think that is part of the process of, of letting go. And it is a muscle. You're right. It takes it takes a minute to to form. Um, what are the misconceptions that a lot of people have about drawing or art? Drawing for art's sake or drawing for... Just like, art. I, th I think I would say art, you know. Are there mm. any misconceptions do you think people have about art? I think if a lot of people have opinions about art and misconceptions are that they have knowledge about it, maybe. <laughs> because it's, it's very hard to explain how complicated it is. It's a really complicated process. It's simple, but it's complicated. And that's psychology. I think a lot of people don't mention the psychology aspect of art, but I think the psychology aspect is very strong. So will you uh, help me understand what is the simple part and what's the complicated part? The simple part is just picking up a brush and making a gestured mark. Um, the complicated part of it is maintaining a structure with that type of approach or a structure with anything as well, because I really believe everything needs some structure underneath it. I think the structure underneath in a way is the subconscious almost. I think you can actually see an analogy with that. Um, I've just run, I just ran a painting course for beginners for the first time. So it was really interesting seeing them go through that process. I researched Flemish painters and there's quite a lot of information on the Flemish technique, which is, a step-by-step -step layering process and I think what I saw with those students through that because it was quite slow and it was step-by-step -step, they really worked out and what I really emphasized at the beginning of that process is to keep changing the composition until it's right I think that's one of the maybe that's a misconception with people that look at art they think that you just put it on and it stays there they don't understand how much artwork changes to get it right how you have to it's very hard to make a mark and then cover it or take it off. And so I emphasize that at the very beginning for beginners, that art is an active, like paintings are a living thing and you need to constantly be changing them. They will always change and that you just have to accept that as the process. Hmm. What would you tell your 25 year old self today if you could give her any advice? I. I would tell her to having fun is good fun, <laughs> but that to really have a rich life that um, I need to just learn a bit earlier than what I did to focus and just focus my energy, contain my energy into something that's going to build and I think what I used to do was I used to have a lot of energy, but I would disperse it on a quite a wide plane and nothing was really happening for me. I was just sort of like floating around 
Can you explain that when you disperse it on a wide plane? What do you mean? Uh, well, I, I would travel a lot. I would move around a lot. I'd go skiing. I wasn't really putting down any roots. I was experiencing. I learned a lot. It was. I learned a lot of street. I was like really young, naive from the suburbs of Sydney, the southern suburbs of Sydney. I knew nothing when I went overseas. And it's actually quite dangerous. Like when you go to really highly populated countries, there's a lot of, you're, pretty, you're quite vulnerable when you're female especially and by yourself, moving around and travelling. So, and yeah, I think that um, doing that kind of helped me really work out what I wanted to do when I came back. Um, so, yeah, but I just think I made it lift it a little bit. I think I wish I had come back five years earlier. I think your ability to understand, I think anyone's ability to understand their own self and navigate it, it's such a big deal. You know, the fact that you already know that you have so much energy. So how does it channel? And mm. I'm finding as well that I just needed a lot of stimulation. Like I need a lot, my brain needs so much activity that I can't, focus on one thing completely without having something else going on maybe it's related but it's got to be something separate something as simple as reading is very helpful when you know you're reading a, a fiction book um my head while I'm still you know doing the podcast or or doing you know making music or doing something I still have that that book at the back of my mind going so my brain is still stimulated wow it, 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 yeah <laughs> it took me I'm like oh my brain is like getting a massage like it's so relaxed because it's still it needs something to think about mm. and I think a lot of people have that but I feel like it's just a lot more for me is there anything that you wanted to mention to our viewers and listeners anything in particular for any artists any young artists that may want to exhibit you don't need to worry about whether you're going to become an artist or not because what you learn can be applied to so many different things. And I think you give, it does give you, if it's taught properly, it does give you a really deep understanding of your own psychology. And, and I think that is the first step to learning how to let go when you understand psychology. Oh my God, you hit the nail. Come on. <laughs> because I, it, just, it just reminded me of a time when I was at art school and I was in the studio and I had this painting, like this blank piece of paper right in front of me. It looked beautiful. The big white. The Your big white. white the big white. And I had all my references like printed on the side and mm. all the information about all the like things that I want to include in there, maybe some material I want to use. I was planning. Yeah. Then my teacher walks in and he removes all the plans and he's like, just make shit. And he said, yeah. if you make shit, shit will happen. Mm. And just to let go of that planning, again, coming back to letting go. Yeah. And I, I think, refer back to that all the time. Yes. Yeah. And I think for me, what I would say in that situation is the same as like make shit. But I think what I would say is trust yourself. You don't need that stuff. You've already done the research. It's already there. You have it. You need to trust that. You need to let go of that and trust that you have it and just then just make shit. And then just make shit. Yeah. <laughs> you have a much more gracious approach, Carmel. <laughs> well, I like to have things, if someone tells me how to do something, I like to know why. And I think, so when I teach, I include that in my teaching because for me, I need to know why. I don't fully understand things. I think if I know why, my understanding becomes embodied. It's it's a deep understanding then. I remember once in your workshops, um, I think it was during your workshops, you mentioned how you wanted to make like a, a tools course, like a tools workshop for women because you, were, you <laughs> yeah, wanted to. I remember that. Yeah, do you remember that? You were like, I just, yeah. it's, you know, you, you learned so much from your dad. I remember you learned That's so right. much from him. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about, you know, learning from him and gaining all that tools and that knowledge? I was lucky. The reason that happened with my father, because he was already retired when I was at art school and he had a big, he had his own business. He, he was a metal manufacturer, so he was a steel man. And he had his, but he had a great shed at home, beautiful um, workbench. He had all the tools, he had everything. And then when I was at NASA, actually, in the first year I started making timber assemblages 
So he had table saws and drop saws and everything. So I would get, my mother had already died by that time. So I would go and stay there and I would get up at six and I'd be in his shed and then he would come down a bit later. And then we worked side by side. He always had his projects that he was working on. And then I think working side by side, because again, it's not like a conscious, oh, he's teaching me thing. It's he's doing his thing. I'm doing my thing. We're both letting go free in our own zones. But then in, he would show me how to do something as I needed it. And so it was like, and I would help him hold something if he needed to, you know, do something. So it was like a natural collaboration. And I think that's why it sort of became a very deep thing. It sort of turned into an emotional experience as well. And I, I'm so grateful for that. But I remember the classes, I wanted to run classes to teach women how to use tools. And Did you end yeah. up doing it? No, but I do end up doing it with all my interns. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I remember you taught me a thing or two. Um, but if anyone wants to learn how to make a swing, just see Carmel and she'll help you make a big giant swing. Um, I should put that up again. That's You sweet. should totally yeah. put that up again. Carmel, thank you for being on the show. <laughs> Thanks, Bunny. That was really great. That was really fun. What a sweet episode. Love, love, love. You can follow at Carmel Burn Art to keep up with more of Carmel's work. That's at C-A-R-M-E-L-B-Y-R-N-E-A-R-T. All right, see you all next week, folks.